Welcome to our monthly San Gregorio chapter trail talk series. My name is John St. Clair, and I am the Zoom host for these events. And tonight's topic is our national monuments, America's hidden gems. And next month's topic is troubleshooting your hikes. So before we uh, get into uh, listening to our guest speaker tonight, I have a few things to go over. As the Zoom host, um, I have made Julianne co-host and uh, everybody should be muted except for the speaker and the uh, hosts until the speaker's all done and then we can open it up for people to talk. So if you have questions, if you think about a question during uh, the presentation, what we'd like you to do is click on the little talking bubble icon at the bottom of your screen that says chat. And it's the default is set to send it to everyone, that's fine. And you can type a message there that everyone will receive. Now, I am going to right now um, put something there. So I just sent in the chat section um, the link to the YouTube channel that has uh, all of our recorded trail talks. Uh, you should have received an email today, a reminder email from me that had that link in the email message. And I want to point out some people have told me those emails are going into their spam folder and they're not seeing it in their regular email. So if you didn't get a reminder email this afternoon, it might be in your spam folder and the link to the YouTube channel is also there. So I also want to point out, um, we have begun doing real live outings again. And so uh, if you go to the San Gregorio chapter website, um, you will see the outings listed in the middle, and um, there are quite a few outings, and and uh, including some by me. I'm rein uh, uh, reinvigorating after a two-year hiatus because of the pandemic, starting again with the uh, Cucamonga Wil Seven Peaks of the Cucamonga Wilderness program, where you can earn a patch, a beautiful patch. Uh, if you hike the Seven Peaks in the Cucamonga Wilderness, the first of which is April 27th. And I'm doing some conditioning hikes prior to that so people can get in condition to hiking high altitudes. And other outings leaders are also scheduling hikes. So take a look at that. Um, it's wonderful to be back out there on the trail. So um, make sure you're muted. Um, and at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over. I'm going to remove my spotlight and turn the meeting over to Julianne Anderson, who will introduce the speaker and say anything I forgot to say. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, I don't think you forgot anything, but uh, welcome, everyone. As John has uh, stated in such a lovely way, uh, this is our monthly um, video uh, gathering uh, to talk about all things trail, our trail talk. And uh, this month, we are so incredibly lucky to have photographer Q Chi Wong uh, join us to talk about his fabulous, stunning book. And I have it right here, Our National Monuments. If, if you haven't seen this or you know purchased it, do. It is absolutely stunning. Uh, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it uh, here in Riverside. Our, our independent bookstore is Cellar Door Books, and they can get it for you, support your independent bookseller. Um, but it, uh, photographer QT Long, who is with us tonight, um, has just outdone himself. And he's, he's detailing uh, tonight the process of, of uh, putting the book together, his photographic process and uh, his photography of the national monuments and the national parks in our treasured lands. So I'd like to um, briefly introduce him and then um, 
Tuan is, is also going to tell you his story in much more detail because it's a fascinating story of how he joined us here in California and, and his photographic journey. So Q Tree Wong was the first to photograph all of America's 62 national parks in large format photography. He received the National Parks Conservation Association's Robin W. Winks Award for Enhancing Public Understanding of National Parks and was featured in the Ken Burns film, one of my favorite Ken Burns series, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. His photographs are extensively published and have been the subject of large format books, including Treasured Lands, winner of 12 national and international book awards, uh, many newspaper and magazine feature articles, uh, solo gallery and museum exhibits across the United States and abroad. So with that, our celebrated California photographer, QT Wong. Uh, Tuan, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, John and uh, Julianne for inviting me and for this introduction. So, and um, thank you to all of you for attending tonight. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let's see, hold on. I have a bit technical problem here with my PowerPoint. Okay, can you see my screen here? Yes. Okay, so now I think. You can probably just use oh, here, 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 right yes. arrow key. Yeah, it's, I don't know what is the problem. Hold on. Uh, so it's, and each time it seems to be different problem. I don't know why my. Okay, let's see. Because my PowerPoint is not in, is not in slideshow mode for some reason now. Oh, hold on. Take your time, Tuan. We've got yeah. plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I don't know what's going on. Okay, because. We can see it. We can see it. Can't you see it? Well, the problem is that I have the wrong controls in my window, so I cannot advance to the next slide. If you just click on the slide with your uh, mouse, it should advance. No, no, it, no it, it, it doesn't actually. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on again. Try the right arrow. If you press the right arrow key on your keyboard, that might advance the slide. Yeah, it, it, it does, but it's, well, it's not really ideal, but yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so, well, because, okay, let's see. Well, the problem is that I'm supposed to be on slideshow mode, but apparently I'm, I'm not. Uh, oh. Okay, so, so do, do you see the, do you see the, which slide do you see now? The opening slide. Okay, so that's wrong. Okay, so maybe I need to restart PowerPoint. I don't know exactly. Take your time. Yeah. Okay, let me restart PowerPoint. Here we go. Um, we see the window. Okay, what do you see in the window now? Just the window symbol and a blue with blue. Okay, so security alert. Okay. Okay, so I think that's good now. Okay, sorry for the problem. That's all right. Yeah, I think this is good now. Hold on, I have to resize a bit my window because now the zoom controls, they are, they are over my... Uh, okay, let's see. We, we don't see the zoom controls at all. We just see your slide and the picture of you. Okay, the problem is that the, the zoom controls now, they are... They, they, are, they are over the, um, um, the buttons that I need to advance my slides. Okay, so I'm going to try to move the window. Maybe drag them. Uh, those. 
Hmm. Okay, hold on. I'm to see if I can move. Okay, okay, I I, I move then. So okay, so I'm good. All right. Okay, so here we are. Okay. See and move that. Aha, Paris. Okay, so okay, I was a more unlikely person than most of you to photograph America's public lands. So I will start with my story. I was born in Paris from Vietnamese parents, and I grew up as a city kid until my college friends took me up the high peaks of the Alps. I discovered for the first time the wilderness and made a connection with nature. My world totally changed after that. I took up photography then as a means to bring back the beauty of mountain tops to friends and family who could not go get there. At first, my goal was just to document my climbs. But soon, I began to understand more about the light and the art of photography. In the summer of 1992, I undertook my last climb in the Alps. Beautiful light at sunset, but isn't it a bit late to be on the summit? This climb was different. It was intended as a photo trip. The winter after this trip, I moved to San Francisco Bay Area. At that time, I was an artificial intelligence computer scientist. I was looking for a short postdoc position in the US. I didn't, I didn't know much about the geography of America. Other climbers had told me Yosemite had some good rocks to climb. Of all the great research universities, I chose Berkeley because it was the closest to Yosemite. I didn't know anything about the national parks, but I heard that there was a vertical cliff 3,000 feet high in Yosemite, the tallest in North America. So I went there and discovered a vertical wilderness at an impressive scale new to me. The climbs took several days, and for sleeping, we had those foldable platforms called portalages. Very comfortable. <laughs> Just make sure you don't roll during your sleep. <laughs> I didn't fall out of the portal edge. The mountain called again, and in the spring of 1993, I set my sight on Denali, highest mountain in North America at more than 20,000 feet. What makes the climb up Denali special is a combination of mountaineering and Arctic expedition. Temperature can go down to minus 40 degrees. You build snow walls to prevent your tents from to protect your tents from strong winds. You start with supplies for three weeks. That's the time it takes to acclimatize, climb, and wait out storms. That's too heavy to carry, so in addition to a backpack, you pull aside. I didn't freeze to death and made it to the summit. With glaciers extending to the horizon, the immensity of the Spritzed Mountains were at a scale new to me. In the fall of 1993, I visited Death Valley. I had not seen a desert before, so it was an environment new to me. I was previously standing on the coldest mountain on Earth and on the top of North America, but here, was a place with the hottest recorded temperature on Earth and the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere. I was able to appreciate the contrast because I saw both. There are also similarities. If you look at those two images, you can see a vast valley with a salt flat echoing the glaciers. I realized how much diversity was found in the national parks. Each park represents a unique environment, yet collectively, they are all interrelated. Natural landscape photography is one of the most influential contributions of American artists. I began to immerse myself in those traditions. I visited local museums 
and the prints were the most beautiful I'd ever seen. Compared to my experience, my photos of Denali's disappointed me, so it was time for a new approach. I decided to try the same camera as the American Masters, the large format camera. Here is one of the first pictures I took with my new camera in Death Valley. When I inspected the transparency on the light table, I was astonished to see more detail than I noticed when I was standing at the scene. Those two strengths, my desire to see the diversity of the parks and large format photography combined to inspire me to embark on the project to photograph each of the national parks with a large format camera. Instead of going back to France, I settled in the San Francisco Bay Area. I became the first to photograph the 57 national parks in large format in 2022. 20 years later, there are 63 national parks and I'm still the first to photograph all of them in large format. I did about 400 parks visit, returning in all seasons. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service in 2016, I released Treasured Lands, which won 12 awards and became a bestseller. It was the result of more than a quarter century of work. After that publication, I was going to take it easy. However, my next project started in 2017 and, less than, and led in less than four years to the publication of Our National Monuments, which is a book I will be discussing today. First, what are national monuments? Ask a person on the street and you will probably hear something like that. However, in the United States, the term has a more specific meaning. National monuments are more than just human-made landmarks. This was the first national monument, Davis Tower in Wyoming, is a natural feature defined by a 2006 law called the Antiquities Act. National monuments are federally protected areas containing objects of historic or scientific interest. The main difference with national parks is administrative. The president can proclaim national monuments with only a signature, whereas only Congress can establish national parks. As suggested by its name, the Antiquities Act was initially meant to protect native archaeological sites, such as Montezuma Castle, the second national monument. It was necessary to protect sites in an expedited way because back then, native sites were being looted and Congress was too slow to act. Congress had been debating over the Grand Canyon since 1892. By 1908, commercialism was running unchecked, but Congress had not yet acted. President Theodore Roosevelt did by proclaiming the Grand Canyon a national monument. Since 1906, 16 presidents have used the act to preserve some of America's most treasured public lands and waters. Half of today's national parks were first protected as national monuments. Some national monuments fit within an acre. Others protect entire landscapes with natural features as extraordinary as those found in national parks. Those landscape scale national monuments could be seen at national parks in waiting. An, ex an excellent example is Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument located in Southern Utah. It is 50% larger than Grand Canyon National Park. That Sunset Arch, I'm going to show a few more sites from that monument. The Paria Tootstool, so given its size and wildness, 
many of the attractions in Grand Staircase National Monument are quite remote, but this one is very easy to access. Varit Hudus display a particular elegance thanks to their slender white spires. This a nine miles round trip of off trail hike, but it's easier than it sounds as it takes place entirely along a flat and wide dry wash. Still, hiking in the dark to get there at sunrise felt a bit of a slog. The Paria Badlands, there are many areas of badlands in the southwest, but those are the most colorful I've seen. Paria Canyon is located mostly in Vermilion Cliff National Monument that we'll see sometimes later, but starts in Grand Staircase Escalante. The Dry Forge of Coyote Gulch includes four beautiful salt canyons. This one is Peekaboo Canyon, where you find a number of arches, large and small. Willis Creek is at the other end of the monument. A year-round stream and curving walls distinguish its narrows, which start just a quarter mile from the trailhead. Grand Staircase Escante National Monument marked a milestone in conservation. Proclaimed in 1996 by President Clinton, it was the first national monument managed by the Bureau of Land Management. So the BLM is a the nation's largest land caretaker, and that designation marks its evolution towards conservation. Nearby, Bears Ears National Monument shares many characteristics with Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Its location in southern Utah, its size, larger than Grand Canyon National Park, and wondrous Red Hot Country with even more immense vistas. So the previous view was from the Needles Overlook in the north of the monument. This view is from the Moki Dockway at the south of the monument, looking towards the Valley of God. Valley of God is a sandy plain dotted with sandstone buttes and spires, which reminded me of Monument Valley. But Valley of God lacks the commercialization, the two groups and the streams of cars often present at Monument Valley. You can come and go as you please in Valley of the God and even find plenty of places to camp for free. That's Mulet Point. The cliff that you see forms the edge of Cedar Mesa. Cedar Mesa is a 400 square mile plateau known for its density of archeological sites. Bears Ears is primarily a cultural landscape. It includes some of the most iconic ruins on the Colorado Plateau. So this is a fallen roof ruin. Grand Gulch is a 50 mile canyon draining the western half of Cedar Mesa. It has the densest population in North America before the arrival of non-native settlers. Think of a prehistoric Manhattan, if you will. With no official trails, the wilderness experience in Grand Gulch rivals any other in the Southwest. Hidden in the labyrinths of canyons and mesas of bear's ears, there are more cliff dwellings and tribal artifacts than in any other area in the American West. So here we are seeing ruins in Bullet Canyon, which is the tributary of the Grand Gulch. Located behind a large alcove, aptly named Perfect Kiva, is a perfectly preserved Kiva. A modern ladder installed by the BLM invites visitors to climb down into the Kiva. Due to the cold snap, I endured freezing temperature all day. The surprisingly warm temperatures were such a welcome change. 
the ancient builders had designed structures with such efficient insulation out of simple materials. So like Grand Staircase Escalante, Bears Ears National Monument was a milestone in conservation. The Ropi, Navajo, Mountain Ute, Zuni, and Ute, five tribes, five tribes, agreed to set differences apart to petition for the protection of their ancestral lands. In response, President Obama proclaimed Bear Ears National Monument in 2016. It was the first national monument initiated by native people and co-managed by them. National monuments are much less known and visited the national parks. But those two, Grand Staircase Escalante and Bears Ears, have been in the news since 2017. In the spring of that year, President Trump signed an executive order to review all the large national monuments created through the Antiquities Act since 1996 with an eye towards development. He targeted a total of 27 national monuments, including 22 national monuments across 11 states, in addition to five even larger marine areas. The public comment period of the summer of 2017 generated 97% support for the national monuments under review. Yet, on December 4, 2017, the former president ordered size reductions to the two national monuments based in Utah. Grand Staircase Escalante was reduced by half. In particular, all the, ge ge all the geological wonders that I've shown you in the slides would fall outside of the new boundaries. Bears ears was even worse. It was shrunk by 85%. Everything that I showed you again would fall outside the new boundaries. The disrespect to our indigenous people in gutting the monument against their objections was as troubling as the scale of the reduction. In January 2018, I resolved to take action, the only way I knew, by hiking and photographing the 22 land-based national monuments in the review. I found a broad cross-section of natural environments covering a significant portion of the American landscape. Totaling about 11 million acres, they range from Northern Montana, so here that's uh, Missouri, Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument to Southern Mexico, that's Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument, from deserts to one of the three most biologically diverse conifer forests in the world, in Cascade Siskiyou National Monument in Oregon. And one of the most spectacular display of wildflowers in North America during the super bloom in Kaizo Plain National Monument. The Sonoran Desert portion included in Aronwood Forest National Monument and Sonoran Desert National Monument are as beautiful and representative of those in Saguaro National Park if not more pristine. Gian Sequoia National Monument protects more sequoia groves than Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks combined. The bull tree was once considered the largest tree in the world because it has the largest diameter of any living sequoia. Also, it is only the sixth largest by volume. On visits to the tree on two different days, I didn't see anybody on the trail. Also, the famous, around the famous sequoias in the nearby national parks, railings are necessary 
to protect the trees. Here, there was none, and I squeezed into a burn scar, getting inside the tree. Since unlike in the national parks, drones are allowed in national monuments, with nobody around to disturb, I sent my drone in the air at sunrise, capturing the tip of the tree, which, is, which was hardly visible from the ground. Paria Canyon is more than twice as long and every bit as impressive as Zion National Park's Virgin River Narrows. But for the entire day, I saw only a dozen hikers. It is located in the Vermilion Cliff National Monuments, which is named for this extended line of cliffs that you see in your picture. Even if the name Vermilion Cliff National Monument is unfamiliar, you have seen images of the world-renowned rock formation, such as the wave in Coyote Buttes North. There's much more than the wave in the monument. This formation has been called the third wave and is in Coyote Butte South. I hike in the rain, which intensified the colors. Coyote Butte South has slick rock swirls as amazing as those in Coyote Butte North. But when I applied, the odds of winning a permit were 10 times higher possibly because getting to the trailhead requires a high clearance four-wheel drive vehicle. So if you have such a vehicle and did not win a permit, a great alternative is to, to visit the White Pocket. You can walk across in 15 minutes, but that small area easily compares to the most exciting in the Southwest. It is a landscape photographer's dream. Rocks are incredibly twisted with scaly flowers and brain shapes. The usual white layer after which the entire area was named caps red sandstone, creating great contrast. That layer is also more resistant to food traffic than the wave striations and rips. That may explain why the BLM has so far not restricted the area. But this may not last so visit it while you still can. Also note its main attraction, Vermilion Cliff National Monument has also its share of archaeological sites. This petroglyph is called the maze. So I spent months in repeated visits to the 22 national monuments, immersing myself in those sacred lands and discovering remnants of cultures imprinted on the ancient landscape. So many of those monuments were previously unknown to me. I reasoned that those areas were vulnerable because the general public did not know about them and thus was not moved to defend them. This inspired me to publish a book that could help conservation organizations raise awareness of those lands. The result is the first photography book entirely dedicated to America's national monuments. While it includes only a subset of them, the 27 national mon monuments at risk from the review, those comprise the vast majority of the large park scale national monuments. The national parks are created for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. So they are generally equipped with an infrastructure of roads, visitor centers, lodges, campgrounds, and interpretive trails. So while it makes, that makes a visit more convenient, it also brings mass tourism. Last year, Archie's National Park was pre frequently full and closed to new entries by 9 a.m. By contrast, when I photograph three of the most famous natural arches in nearby Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, I had the entire place to myself. With this Gros Venor Arch, a short stroll from the parking area, 
Metate arch doesn't require a much longer stroll, but since the arch is smaller, it is easier to miss. And the first arch was sunset arch that I showed before. Grand Canyon National Park sees crowds of 5 million visitors per year. By contrast, Grand Canyon Parashan National Monument is a place of solitude. This is Whitmore Canyon Overlook. I didn't see any other party from late afternoon to late morning the next day. Not only it is quiet, but it is also a remarkable place. Unlike other overlooks in the Grand Canyon, it is on the lower rim. The river view is excellent as the lookout is not too high above the river. And you have the easiest access to the Colorado River inside Grand Canyon National Park. The trail loses only 900 feet to reach the river as opposed to 3,000 feet from the south rim. The catch is that I needed to rent a Jeep. Grand Canyon Parashan National Monument is a place of adventure. Although its size is comparable to Grand Canyon National Park, there is not a single paved road, and I saw only one restroom. As their development is sometimes minimal, national monuments can test your preparation and self-sufficiency. During the three years of this project, I end up with fire, five flat tires, sometimes in incredibly remote areas. Whitmore Canyon Overlooks was on the lower rim. Grand Canyon Parashan National Monument has also mountains. Mount Logan features a high view of the entire Grand Canyon ecosystem without equivalent in the National Park. The location is not marked on the map provided by the National Park Service. There was little, inf little information on the internet and it was inconsistent. Some mentioned having to hike for hours to get to the summit and others said less than a mile, which was correct. With no visitor centers, no rangers around, no brochures, no guidebooks. The first obstacle in my explorations of the national monuments was to find information. My new book, Our National Monuments, provides you with a starting point I wish I had for planning trips. With my previous book, Treasured Lands, I'd aim to create a book that both inspired and informed. All national monuments follow the same format, depicting each national monument in depth through a selection of representative highlights with skate maps and location information. This one important improvement, so. Except for the foreground, I wrote every word in treasured lands, more than 140,000 of them. For all nation monuments, to amplify the call for conservation, I invited the local activists who advocate for these lands and waters to present their perspective. I'm so grateful that the 27 local citizen associations caring for those monuments each contributed an introduction to their national monument. So I'm to, <coughs> to go through that uh, chapter about um, Mojave, Mojave Trails National Monument, uh, which is at the heart of the California desert uh, and not too far from where you live. So Bigelow Cholen Garden Wilderness protects California densest population of the fluffy cactus. Walking less than half a mile into the wilderness, I found stands more extensive and denser than Joshua Tree's National Park's famous Cholia Cactus Garden. 
only a few miles removed from Interstate 15, Afton Canyon remains hidden and unknown to the millions that speed across the desert. It is a large and deep canyon, sometimes nicknamed the Grand Canyon of the Mojave, with sheer walls more than 300 feet high. For much of its course, the Mojave River runs underground. Afton Canyon is one of the few places where it reliably runs on the surface, a rare sight in the desert. Okay, so let's see. So the stream is generally ankle deep, but there is one exception. Just at the beginning of the canyon, past the campground. Okay, so uh, so you can see uh, here a video of um, of me crossing that uh, that spot with uh, with a, with a rented jeep. It's a fairly long crossing. It's it's like uh, maybe between 100 to 200 yards or something. So the first time I came there, I had my I had another car and I, I didn't dare to, to 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 risk it, and so I I, I returned with a with a better rented car to do that. Let's see. So also the canyon walls look monolithic from a distance. They are full of nooks and crannies that reward off-trail hiking. So the runoff from the surrounding mountains has got fantastic narrow secondary canyons. On both sides of the wash, I found entrances to narrow slot canyons. They are just a few feet wide, several story tall, and littered with boulders that make progressions strenuous. Unlike the Navarro sandstone slots of the Colorado Plateau, the walls were not smooth, but instead strikingly knobby. At Bonanza Springs, willows and cottonwoods improbably line a small canyon for half a mile, the only water source of its size in more than 1,000 square miles of arid desert. Despite a dozen visits to Death Valley National Park, I could never find the mesquite sand dunes devoid of numerous footprints from other visitors. At Cadiz Dunes Wilderness, I saw many animal tracks, but no human footprints. The monument features an abundance of remnants of a volcanic past. That's the Pisgah lava flow. The Pisgah lava flow is home to more than 300 unmarked and undeveloped lava tubes, more than 1,000 feet in length. That's the largest concentration of caves in Southern California. Emboy Crater, one of North America's youngest contact volcanoes is an almost perfectly symmetrical cinder cone. It is perhaps the most easily accessed and developed area in Mojave Trails National Monument. Inside the crater, I found two lava dams behind which former lava lakes are now covered with light colored clay, creating miniature playas with seasonal water. Mojave Trails National Monument also includes the longest undeveloped stretch of historic Route 66, 105 miles of it, from Needles to Ludlow. So here are the spread with the images that you just saw to show you the book's layout. Coffee tables about places often left me frustrated of being in the dark about the location de depicted. In our national monuments, each photograph comes with extended practical travel and photography notes, including observations about natural history and my experiences. So I, I've highlighted seven locations in the monument, 
each of them is precisely keyed on the map of the national monument. And there's an optional PDF formatted for mobile device where maps can be zoomed to full detail. You can find more information about the book at ournationalmonuments.com. There's also a link to Amazon, but it benefits me more if you buy a copy direct from me. So I'm expecting a new shipment in May, but for now I just have six copies left anyways. Also, if you'd like to check out my book about the national parks, that's treasuredlandsbook.com. So besides Mojave Trails National Monument, you are fortunate to live near two of the other national monuments in the book. The first one is San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. It is one of the most developed of the national monuments with visitor centers, well-maintained paved roads, trails, picnic areas, and even two ski areas. Despite the proximity to a metropolis of 17 million, San Gabriel Mountain National Monument include vast, tall, and rugged mountains with dramatic topography. That's from the Devil's Backbone on Mount Baldy at dawn. The mountains are the most prominent component of the monument, but canyons in between are equally impressive. I found the East Fork of the San Gabriel River hike a fun way to acquaint myself with one of those canyons and its delightful river habitat. Despite their dry appearance, the San Gabriel Mountains conceal more than 65 waterfalls. The moderate hike to lower Switzer Falls is one of the most popular in the Front Range. On the northern slope of the San Gabriel Mountains, the mountains drop down to the floor of the Mojave Desert more gradually than on the steep south side. So that's the Devil's Punch Bowl, which is a sandstone formation, unlike the granitic peaks found at higher elevations. Sent to Snow National Monument, of its name to the considerable elevation difference between the Sonoran Desert floor and San Gorgonio Mountain. Southern California's highest peak after which your chapter is named. No roads penetrate the monument's interior. However, lower portions of the south and east are easily accessible thanks to a trio of developed nature preserves on its outskirts. So this is from outside the Mission Creek Preserve. The big Morongo Canyon is the most popular and accessible area in the monument with surprisingly lush wetlands. And the main feature of the Whitewater Preserve is the Whitewater River. This rare desert stream flows year-round. The Black Lava Butte addition is a detached unit of the monument with two volcanic mesas. I found the most exciting section to be the valley between them. The hike among typical Mojave desert plants and granite boulders rival those found in nearby Joshua Tree National Park, but without the crowds. Vivian Creek Trail, starting at a picnic area east of Forest Falls, is the most popular route to San Gorgonio. In winter months, snow covers most of it. I felt like I was the only person on the mountain. So let me conclude this presentation. I've tried to give you a taste of the diversity found in the National Monuments. Visiting the National Monuments was an incredible adventure. They've brought me so much joy. I'd like you to experience for yourself what I'd experience. As the national parks become ever more popular, national monuments, vast open space, offer us places of solitude, of inspiration, and of adventure. I hope that my photograph will inspire you to visit the monument for yourself. And if the experience has enriched your life, to speak out for them. And I thank you in advance for that.
Very, very wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Now let's see if we can, okay, good. You uh, removed the sharing. So now um, lots of people have been asking questions in the chat section. Julianne, do you wanna relay? Sure, and Tuan, what a, what a glorious set of photographs. And thank you for your poetic narration. It's just beautiful. Um, all right. Uh, people would like to know, first of all, um, can you talk about the, the um, large format photography and how it differs from standard photography? What, what do you mean by large format? And how does the, the, the camera looks like Ansel Adams' camera? It, so, so how the, is it, tell us so, about the camera, too. So, so it, it's called large format because of the size of the, of the, of the negative. Okay, so so the the small format camera that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's your thirty five millimeter camera. Then you have medium format, which is a bit larger, and uh, large format it uses a, a film which is doesn't come in rolls but in sheets, and then the the size of the film that I use is five by seven inch. So it means that it's the the negative is five times larger in linear, linear dimension than 35 millimeter film, which means 25 times larger in surface area. So that, that detail, th that size of the negative is what gives large format photography its descriptive power. So you, you, you can make images which are incredibly, incredibly detailed. Okay. How are you able to get that equipment back into some of these remote places it must be heavy and bulky it 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 is for sure you know in 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 some of my alaskan trips you know when when i had to carry survival equipment for for some more difficult climates than southern california uh, from time to time my my backpack weighed 70 pounds yeah so it's it is it it is hard you know but uh, you 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 train, you know, like 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 John, uh, like John mentioned, you know, you you do conditioning hikes and you you keep yourself in good shape. Okay. Um, can you talk about the publication process? How did you find a publisher, and what was what was the process like for a project like this? It must have been lengthy and a lot of back and forth with your publisher. Okay, so. Um, so first, tre tre treasured lens. You know, I, I I I look for publishers for years, but uh, but no, 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 nobody wanted to, to to take on my proposal because um, my vision was to do an all inclusive books about the national parks, so the most comprehensive books about the national parks ever published, and so that that would mean a very big book. You know, like it's it's. So the first edition was 450 pages, and now the current edition is almost, it's going to be almost 500 pages. And so that, that's, that's very expensive to print, you know, and, and so the publishers didn't want to, to, to take a risk with me. And with, with the centennial approaching, I was getting a bit desperate. So I, I resolved to try to do it myself. At one point, I, I hired um, a publishing consultant and uh, and uh, and the guy he just quit because he saw that the project was too risky, and eventually I I was able to find um, an uh, um, an agreement uh, which was um, a mixed publish uh, it's a hybrid publishing agreement which means that I would fund the book pay for all the expenses all the production and all the printing, but then I would benefit from the expertise of an existing publisher for, for the design and, and, and uh, um, this kind of things, right? Um, so that's how I was able to, 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 um, to realize my, my vision for Treasured Lens. And eventually, uh, I, I, I created a publishing house myself. And our national monuments, it is, it is self-published in the sense that it is published by, by my publishing house. So, so from the start, it, it, was, oh. uh, it was designed like that. Oh, OK. 
Okay, so I see it on the spine. That's your logo for your, what's the name of your publishing house? It is uh, Terra Galleria Press. What's the name? Terra Galleria Press, you know, Terra Galleria is my brand, I like my website, yeah. Got it, Terra Galleria, got it. So good to know, uh, uh, and, and uh, are we gonna look forward to another project from Terra Galleria and, and your publications? Well, cert certainly uh, I'd, I'd, try, I'd like to do, uh, to do more books about, um, about the public lands. I just have to, to do, to see how how this one does, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, those those, those those books they 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 cost quite a bit to print, and, and currently, you know, with um, with the, with the pandemic, uh, um, uh, the cost of shipping from uh, from China to to to, to, um, to Los Angeles actually, you know, it 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 just went up the roof, you know, the uh, three years ago. Uh, I paid uh, seven thousand dollars for shipping a container, but uh, for for our nation for 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 my last shipment, you know, I'm I'm paying twenty five k, and so 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 I just have to wow. So so I, so I just have to, to to see how how things go, you know, and if uh, if I manage to to. to to, to, to at least sell enough copies of our national monuments to to envision another book because if i do another book about the about public lands it's going to be about lands which are even more obscure than the national monuments and therefore you know it 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 it, it might be a tough sell i don't know that's okay everybody buy the book so that tuan can do another one um a more obscure question tuan and kind of a fun one how did you keep your Jeep from stalling out when you're out in the Mojave crossing the river? How did you keep from being stranded? Well, you know, as, 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 as long as, as the water level, you know, the, the, doesn't reach the engine, I think you're, I think you're okay. So, yeah, I mean, it, the, 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 the water, it, it, it was like, you know, uh, of say sick high or, or something like that, and and so, so, so those chips they, they they have they have engines which are a bit higher. Yes, so that that was okay. <laughs> what yeah, an but, adventure! But, but some so, so, some 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 rangers actually uh, in in some national some national monuments. I I see their their vehicles and they have a jeep actually with a snorkel. And so the so the air intake is way up, so they, they can really cross uh, cross deep water. Yeah. Two more questions. Um, tell us about your photography, your photographic process, and how you select shots. And second part of that question: In some of the national monuments, did you have uh, rangers or guides that helped you find some of the some of these areas, since they're they're not well documented? So how what's your pro, what's your photographic process and how do you select shots? So first, I I I do a lot of research when I when I when I'm home because I um, not necessarily to, to find um, uh, photo sh photo locations, but more to 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 try to 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 understand um, the natural history of the area, you know, the the lay of the land and this, those kind of things. <laughs> and to 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 find out what makes the area unique, you know, you, the best time of the year to come, and this kind of things. And then, uh, um, when 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 I visit places in general, I try to I try to, to to spend time on on repeat visits, you know, to 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 come maybe at least two or three times at different times of the year to to have uh, to have different conditions, you know, maybe maybe wildflowers sometime and maybe fall colors another time or something like that and so 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 i give myself enough time you know to 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 to, to, to absorb the place and uh, and then i i just photograph all day from uh, from uh, I, I get up one hour before sunrise and then uh, 
I go to bed, uh, you know, after I've done night photography, which is sometimes time 11, midnight or something like that. And, and during the entire day, I photograph, even, even at midday, you know, when, when some folks would think that the night isn't good, I, I always tried to find some subject appropriate for that light and, uh, and I still photograph. So, so, so I, so I come home with a fair no amount of photograph, but still I, 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 I I don't shoot indiscriminately. I don't shoot without discrimination because um, the discipline that I got by by photographing in large format actually um, is such that I, I tried to, to make each photograph count. You know, so when when so nowadays I I photograph in digital. Mostly, I still have the large format camera, I still use it. But that project was photographed mostly in digital. Also, there's a, there's a few large format photographs from the, from the 90s in the book. Just after the Grand Staircase Escalante was established, actually, I, I rushed there also to, to photograph there. Um, but, but then, uh, um, uh, in, in digital, uh, I, so I, I don't shoot and spray, so I try to photograph deliberately. But still, when you photograph all day and over so many days, you know you, right. you end up with a lot of shots. So, and after that, I I, I try to 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 select the photographs so that they they tell a story of the monument. So you know, not 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 only just for the aesthetic qualities, you know, but they together you you look at the photograph and then they 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 really tell you all the aspect of what the monument is about. So now to, 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 the, to the second question, uh, uh, no, I, I, I didn't have help from, 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 from any rangers for, in, for in the monuments. So, so first, I think many of those monuments, they, they, they don't have visitor centers, okay? And from time to time, you, 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 you can find a visitor center, which is like more like an interagency visitor center, you know, that, that doesn't cater specifically to the monument, but where they, where they, they, they cater to, to, to all the public lands around that area, you know, something, uh, something like all, all the monuments and, uh, and national parks around that area or something like that. So, so those are the, the type of places where, where you can get some information. And so, so, so I come there, yeah. So when I come there, yeah, it's mostly to, to ask the, the rangers about the conditions, you know, because often, so those, those places where you, where you drive on unpaved road, uh, it, it, is, it can be critical, you know, it, it can vary a lot. So, so that's, that's more the type of information that I'm, that I'm looking for rather than, rather than what to photograph, because it's something that, that I found myself through, through my research. Wonderful. I think, oh, and last question. Uh, Tell us a little more about your next project. Are you gonna, you mentioned that you're gonna do some even more remote areas. What are you thinking? Yeah, so, so, so you know, I'm thinking about, so, you know, the, so we have the national parks, uh, which are, which are the, the pinnacle of conservation here in, in the US. So we have the, the national monuments, which are, which are well, kind of one step below, you know, and, but then I, I'm thinking about about areas which are which are not even yet national monuments, but that that deserve to become national monuments, and speci specifically about areas which are managed by the Bureau of Land Management. You know, so they have they have a new system which is called the the National Conservation Land System. And it is it is something which is very new. It started in this this century, you know, and and they are trying to they are trying to, to, to expand it and to, to to publicize it a bit more. And so so I'd like to 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 to, to try to help with that. Tuan, I have a nominee for your for your new project, the entire Eastern Sierra. I I work for the city of Los Angeles and uh, the 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 comment is it would it should be a national park except that the city of los angeles owns all of the owens valley and their water rights so it's almost like a de facto national park in that way but 
honestly, I think Eastern Sierra should be maybe some someone should be thinking about making it a national park in some way. The the parts of it that are already covered by Sequoia. Um, yeah, 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 and and and, and I think for. It's currently the, the Alabama hills, you know, are, are not part of the park, but that's where you have the best view of Mount Whitney. And yes. it's, it's such a wonderful area, which is managed currently by the BLM, that it, it, it would be great if it, if it was uh, more, more protected than it currently is here. Well, I, I'll never forget that view from the White Mountains, and I'm sure you've been there. If you, if you go into the White Mountains there and you look across at the, at the Eastern Sierra, that 200 mile series, uh, you know, that, that line, it's, it's just unbelievable. So I, I hope it finds its way into your project. So, well, I think that is the last of the questions. Um, does anyone else have a question that we want to pose to, uh, to Tuan? Uh, if not, what a spectacular presentation, Tuan. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, everyone give it up for our photographer QT Luan. And uh, uh, we sure appreciate your time. We sure appreciate your time. Um, and your wonderful book. So, uh, bravo, bravo. Thank you again for, for 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 listening today and and uh, um, looking looking at my photographs. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh,